Help us eat all this. Yeah, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Get some wine. So, hi everybody. Tonight we're really excited. Um, Matei Vakula is going to be speaking with two collaborators um, from Sloan Kettering. So, Yossi Shimei and Dr. Daniel Heller will present um, kind of the research and the project they've been working on for over a year um, together. And they are going to give themselves a full introduction because they each have very interesting stories. And we will get started. Okay. Good. I'll get out. Okay, uh, guys. So uh, thank you very much uh, for coming in this super cold uh, weather. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so we will uh, introduce uh, our collaboration, and then uh, first uh, Dan will be talking about. Uh, his, uh, his lab and what they do, and then we will kind of slide into uh, the project we did together and then another project we're working on right now together. Um, so my name is Matej, Matej Vakula. Um, I uh, am a member of Genspace and we are, uh, um, and I'm collaborating with these guys too uh, for over one and a half a year already. And I met them here at the annual party two years ago, I think, right? <laughs> it's all started here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'm an artist. Uh, uh, I work with uh, biology and other media. Uh, I am really interested in, uh, you know, social and uh, um, kind of uh, human impact of science or a laboratory. Onto, onto the society and onto you know like knowledge uh, mapping knowledge production and all of these uh, you know ways it can be represented as uh, uh, open source or free knowledge production from uh, you know kind of like Gen Space is doing up to like uh, you know uh, pharmaceutical companies or any other um, uh, knowledge production uh, places and uh, yeah I am. Uh, I'm working in the arts field already for, I don't know, like a very long time. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so I would maybe uh, give uh, the word to, to Dan and you'll see. So I'm a, my name is Dan Heller. I'm a professor at uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I run a lab there. And I'm also a professor at uh, Wild Cornell Medical College uh, in Cornell Medical School. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the focus of my lab, um, but I'll, I'll, let my, uh, I'll let Yossi say who he is. Uh, uh, my name is Yossi. I'm a, a postdoc in the Dan's lab. I'm from Israel. I have a PhD in chemistry and pharmacology. And uh, yeah, started uh, about three and a half years ago. Uh, really like it and excited to show you what uh, we're working on. So, yeah, so this. Uh, it will, will, you'll probably be interested to hear how all this came about in terms of this collaboration. It's uh, certainly never thought I'd be here presenting with Mate, so this is uh, interesting, and so we'll talk about that. Um, uh, my, my background also is in kind of in chemistry, and I would call myself a biome biomedical engineer by now, and that's kind of what, what our lab does. So I'll just kind of give you an overview of, of, of that to start. Um, here's our little. Uh, uh, mix of kind of the, the, the science and the art, uh, but, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so our kind of philosophy in my lab is that we're engineers and we're focused on nanotechnology, which is uh, a field that involves uh, making materials and doing um, uh, engineering and, and chemistry and science uh, on a scale in the, the, the nanoscale making materials that are very small. So we kind of represented ourselves as engineers where this guy's making a rocket engine. We're making much smaller things, but uh, it was, so it's a little, uh, um, but you know, nano rocket engines, you would say. Um, but uh, our lab is at Sloan Kettering, literally next door to the hospital, the Memorial Hospital, across the street from uh, Cornell, uh, Cornell's main hospital, one of the uh, New York Presbyterian hospitals couple of doors down from a hospital special surgery. Um, and in that area, if you, in case you might not know, there are hundreds of, uh, of, of 
biomedical research laboratories. Uh, it's a, it, there's a lot of research space in New York City. You wouldn't know that these are research buildings. Um, but so we're collaborating a lot it, with, um, with other researchers. Um, most of them are biologists. And um, our lab is making research tools to try to, uh, to, to try to make, often making sensors, ways to detect things that biologists can't, can't do and making kind of research tools to facilitate their work and accelerate the pace of biomedical research uh, focusing on cancer research. But we also collaborate a lot with doctors, um, maybe exactly these doctors right there, uh, or <laughs> friends of theirs. Um, and, uh, and, and, we, uh, and, and that's kind of how we indirectly interact with patients. We're, we're researchers, I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. Uh, along with, uh, as well as Yossi, and we're collaborating with them to make better uh, therapies, at, you know, at actual uh, drugs, and, um, and diagnostics and ways to de detect disease. Uh, and especially, we're focused on detecting uh, disease at early stages. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and so, the thought of our lab is that we're really come from the technology side. The people in our lab are chemists, physicists, engineers, um, and then a couple of biologists creeping in and then collaborating with kind of a sea of biologists and, 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 uh, and doctors around us. And so we think about how we can make technologies and, how, and, and where they intersect with all of the biomedical research problems and clinical problems being in a cancer center. You, we know there's a lot of them. And so we kind of call this intersection solutions. We're making technologies, and where we can get them to answer or to address a problem, we make uh, solutions to the problems. And then being right next to a hospital, we're able to really uh, not only grow technologies, but also move them in the direction of, of addressing the problem. So because we're, we're right there. Um, and we're very lucky in that most engineers are not right where the, bio where the biology and where the uh, clinical problems are. So that's kind of the philosophy of our lab. This is a picture of our lab about a year ago. Um, we're a couple more people in this now, um, but Yossi's right there. And, and uh, so we're uh, in the Zuckerman Research Center, which is um, right across the street from Memorial Hospital. It's in the Upper East Side on 68 and, and 1st. And, um, uh, and so uh, being in this in this area, right in this biomedical kind of and, uh, research and, and uh, clinical hub, we're uh, we're really it's a it's a very good place to do biomedical research. So we focus on nanomaterials. Some of them are the ones I show you there, uh, carbon nanotube without the Spider Man on it. Um, but others are nanoparticles. We're basically in this realm of making materials, engineering materials that are very small, um, anywhere between about 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of a hair to maybe 100 times smaller than the diameter of a hair. So in that, in that realm. Um, and we're doing a lot of collaboration, as I said, and we're focused on making biosensors and therapies, mostly focused on two major problems. One, which is the problem we're going to talk about right here, which is that we focus on the fact that metastatic cancer is cancer that's spread throughout the body, it's with, is responsible for 90% of cancer deaths. And if someone gives uh, most of the time a treatment for this, it can't, it's usually inoperable for surgery, so people give chemotherapeutic drugs. And the drugs go everywhere in the body, and they're not focused on targeting just the, the tumor sites. And so we have, uh, so our, our focus is can we make, a, uh, make the drugs uh, get closer to the tumor than the rest of the, the healthy tissues in the body because if um, uh, because those drugs are usually highly toxic and even if they're not highly toxic they cause some degree of side effects and um, in, a, in a, almost in every case there's a dose limiting side effect where you can't give any more drug because the side effects get so bad and so can we focus on targeting drugs right to those tumor sites um, to avoid those side effects and get more drug to the tumor and so um, and to do that, we focus on making nanoparticles that, that target uh, tumor sites, and that's what I'm going to focus on. The other half of our lab, which I'm not going to talk about, um, although I think I gave a talk more focused on that about two years ago here at GenSpace, was we're also interested in early disease detection. Before the disease gets this bad, can we, get, uh, can we detect disease 
um, at an early stage, um, or can we, uh, and, and it's, we're not only focused on cancer in this way, but um, we are definitely have a big focus on, uh, focus on cancer, or can we just do measurements of things that one wants to measure inside of living cells, tissues, living body, and, um, and that it goes back to not only diagnostics, but also can we make research tools that will uh, accelerate uh, research and be, and be able to uh, allow questions that couldn't be answered before to be answered. And so for that, we're focused on other nanomaterials that I'm not gonna talk about, mostly carbon nanotubes um, and making optical probes out of them. But what, I'm, what we're focused on here are the nanoparticles for a main reason is that Mate's work actually uses the nanoparticles that we make for cancer into art. And then his research or his work with us on, the, on art actually translated back into findings that we use to understand the nanoparticles. So it kind of is a two-way collaboration. Um, and so <coughs> briefly, I'm gonna tell you what the, how this all, uh, what, what these nanoparticles are and how they're working and why that ends up making art. Um, because you probably don't see the connection right now. I certainly <laughs> would. Um, so when we think about how to get a particle full of drug, sometimes really nasty drugs, to a cancer, we think about it a couple of different ways. One is can we just put something on these particles, which are represented by these little, uh, these little circles here, full of drug, which is the red little dots. Uh, and, and then these yellow things are supposed to be something that targets the cancer. And many people think in the drug delivery nanoparticle space, can you make these things stick to something specific on the cancer cell and, and that will get the drug to the cancer cell and basically the, the particles just flowing through the blood and getting and eventually hitting the cancer and getting the particle with the, with the drug on the cancer cell. We think that that probably is not the best way to go because the blood vessels that carry the particles are, it's hard to control where these particles are gonna get out of the blood. And so we focus on something else, which is can we put a, make these particles target not the cancer itself, but the blood vessels that are near the cancer. And that's kind of our philosophy, or our thought of this, our strategy is that if we can target the blood vessels that are near the cancer, then we can either do one of two things. We can kill that blood vessel, if it's a small blood vessel, like capillary near, near the cancer, that'll deplete the cancer of nutrients and oxygen and things it needs to survive and the cancer will die or if there's a way to get the particle out through the, this blood vessel um, and to the cancer, then that'll work too. But we, we're targeting a blood vessel. And the thought of um, why, or what we're gonna put into these particles, so we have, we're talking about drugs in the particle, we're talking about tar hitting the, the blood vessels. We think about it, um, uh, we think about actually putting personalized medicine. So has anybody heard about personalized medicine um, in, and it's kind of a buzzword now, and actually um, there's a big initiative now on, on personalized medicines that was signed by um, Obama maybe a year or so ago, um, where we're focusing on, um, on making a, a medicine that's right for a particular patient. And um, another form of, another uh, buzzword that also is related to personalized medicine is, is targeted therapy. Um, and targeted therapy is not uh, it, when we think in, in the targeting particles to cancer, that's one sort of targeted uh, therapy. But what most people are thinking about is the same thing as personalized medicine, which is basically, this is a complicated picture that you don't need to know about really, but the, the idea is that a cancer is driven by certain mutations. Those mutations um, are driving a process in, the, in, the, uh, in a cell to go awry. And there are many drugs now that are targeting part of this process, part of the actual, uh, something that where the, the mutation caused a change in, in the proteins in the, in the cancer cells, and uh, that, that causes basically a chain reaction where the cancer cell grows out of control. And uh, personalized medicines and targeted therapies are focused on hitting just a certain protein or a certain part of this path that drives the cancer and making it stop. And so a lot of drugs are now focused on this because this is supposed to be a silver bullet. Let's get a drug that only hits the, um, that protein. But unfortunately, these drugs all still have bad side effects. And that's our thought, is that 
if these drugs still have bad side effects and these dose limiting toxicities, we need to still target them to a location. So we call it targeting targeted therapies, where we have targeted therapies, the drugs that are being developed now very fast, and also targeting to them to a location. And so we think about this, we make a ball of wax or a ball of yarn, or really a ball of something like, what well, this, is, this is supposed to be a picture of rubber, a ball of rubber bands. But, and really we're making a nano-sized ball that almost is made of a somewhat similar material, it's not that far from the truth, um, filled with a drug and has some sort of targeting property, has some sort of molecules on the outside of it that stick to um, not the cancer cells, but the blood vessels involved in, in cancer. And then we have a drug, a tar usually a targeted therapy, inside of this uh, particle. And now we're going to get this thing to stick to the blood vessels uh, involved in the cancer. And so now these blood vessels in, that are related to cancer, actually many of them, a lot of what we're focused on is that some of these things have, some, some of these blood vessels in, it, that are feeding cancer have different markers, different proteins on the inside of the blood vessels and the walls than healthy uh, blood vessels. And we're trying to understand that, the biology of that. Um, there are ways to actually do things to cause more proteins to show up in certain blood vessels like irradiating, like, like radiation therapy, which is already used for cancer. But, but some uh, cancer blood vessels, are, they already have these, these molecules. And basically we have the, the, the particle made out of uh, something that binds to them. And the idea is to get that particle stuck on the wall of the blood vessel involved in, in a growing tumor. And then either make some, you know, we can put nasty stuff inside this to kill the blood vessel, but more often now we're putting targeted therapies and finding out that we're able to get these, the, the, the drugs from here to the tumor that's right outside of this blood vessel that, the, that is being fed by uh, this blood vessel. And so, and the idea is that this, these things can fall apart, the drug can get out and, and treat the, the cancer. And so we think of it more like this, where we're, we're, here's a tumor with tumor blood vessels and we're getting these things to go not only here, but also all over this tumor and then release, then basically, um, degrade there and release drug and, um, and kill the tumor. And so that's the, the strategy um, that we're, we're going about. And I haven't even got to exactly how this translates to art. Yossi is going to be the one to do that. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Oh, you went back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a good okay, so, uh, it was a really nice one. <laughs> so I guess uh, the problem that the doctor that we first talked to was uh, a uh, Buafa, uh, doc, he was interested in liver cancer and in Don't personalized therapy. Uh, how do I do the? Okay. So uh, there's uh, the gold standard in liver cancer was serafinib or Nexavar in personalized therapy is a drug given as a pill. And basically, the patient gets have to take the pills twice a day, and for the rest of their life. And the only benefit they get is maybe three to six months, which which is a lot. But the side effects are horrible. They get uh, ear, um, um, got in, in in unbearable rash that uh, they sometimes they prefer to stop the treatment because the, the, the itching is unbearable. And we saw that maybe we can use this drug uh, in a nanoparticle to avoid the skin toxicity, which usually nanoparticles don't go to the skin. We can focus the, the drug in the, li in the liver. Uh, if, you if, you, if you think about it, it, I mean, our working hypothesis of drug delivery is that the drugs are actually good. We know when we test them in cells in the lab, they kill the cancer, but because they don't get into the cancer into high amounts, uh, usually these drugs taken systemically only uh, half a percent, 0.5 percent, will actually reach the cancer. The rest of the drug will just go all over the body. 99.5% goes to the rest of the body. Uh, so this is the drug strafinib. Um, it's not soluble. Uh, if, you, if you don't know any, you don't have to know any chemistry. Um, it's, it's not charged. It's, it's only soluble in alcohol or oil. So it, you cannot inject it into the blood. So this is like the, the drug, one milligram of the drug in water precipitates like sand into the epinops. It's, it's not soluble. And we accidentally found, so in nanoparticles, usually what we, we want to make the drugs encapsulated into a nanoparticle that we will become water soluble. So we make a, a non-water soluble drug soluble so you can inject it and it will specifically go to the cancer cell. 
So we accidentally in the lab, while working with usually polymers, real macromolecules that wraps like the rubber bands that Dan showed, the polymers will wrap around the drug molecules and protect it uh, in the bloodstream until it is degraded in the tumor and releases the drug. So we wanted to put a dye uh, inside of that nanoparticle so we can track the nanoparticles going around the body. And we accidentally found a, a, it was a, a serendipitous uh, discovery uh, that the dye that we chose, this infrared dye, uh, will actually uh, self-assemble with that drug to form a nanoparticle without the polymer. So basically the way we saw it was uh, I had a student that helped me and we, we did all kind of uh, trial and error of different concentrations of polymers and the drugs and different concentration of dyes. And at the lowest concentration of polymer and a high concentration of dye, we saw beautiful nanoparticles. And we, for me, it was the first time I saw that you can make a nanoparticle without a, a polymer or a liposome or a lipid. And this is basically how it, you, you see the interaction. You use just water in the drug, you get a white pellet, the drug is precipit precipitated, and you add a small amount of dye, it, it, it's, it's infrared, but you have a green color, they precipitate together. That means that they, they want to have interaction with each other. Uh, you get a green pellet. Then you just increase the concentration a little bit, the pellet becomes smaller, the, the drug does not precipitate, and you just, uh, in 30 microliters, so the, the ratio here is like one to 30. So for every 30 molecules of drug, you have one molecule of, of, of dye. So one dye, molecule of dye can help stabilize 30 molecules of drug. And basically what we, we get is a completely water-soluble drug just by adding a dye to it. So that's, that was a kind of a, a serendipitous discovery. The interesting part uh, became there because I, I was very excited. I wanted to test all the drugs I had in the fridge. I took out all the drugs and I started to see have and I could basically saw that I had uh, a, a, a new kind of uh, classification. I had the group of drugs that self-assembled with the dye to form nanoparticles which are water-soluble and are stable, and all the other drugs that did not self-assemble with the drug, and they precipitated. And for, for us, basically, it was a puzzle because we tried to look at the structures, try to find commonalities. What, how do you predict which drug will self-assemble and not? Uh, this we, we actually did some uh, computational um, experiments and machine learning, which maybe we'll, we'll tell you a little bit later. But this is uh, basically to look inside that Eppendorf to see how these nanoparticles look like. We knew it's a nanoparticle because we measured the size of the vesicles with uh, light scattering, but we actually wanted to see it. We saw that every drug makes a different particle. So this is a chemotherapy for breast cancer, Papitaxel, this is for liver cancer, this is for melanoma, this is for a uh, different type of triple negative breast cancer. And you see this, they're mostly spherical, but they have different surfaces. And the idea is that the, the, these particles are made mostly out of the drug, but they're stabilized by that dye molecule. And that dye molecule is, is highly charged, it's negatively charged. It actually has sulfuric acid on it, like a moieties of sulfuric acid. And we, when we incubate cells with it, cancer cells, we also see a differential uptake uh, mechanism. So you see here, it's actually hard to see, but this is endothelial cells uh, liver cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, and leukemia, and we see that some types of cancer really like to eat up those nanoparticles, and some types of cancer don't like them at all. And we, we try to kind of find the correlation, how do you know which cancer type like them, and uh, we found this marker, this protein, CAV1. It's a, a scaffold protein that uh, sits on the membrane of the cells in lipid raft, uh, or it's called uh, uh, cholesterol-rich areas in the membrane, that's called lipid raft. So if the cells have a lot of cholesterol and a lot of um, uh, hydrophobic regions, that hydrophobic means that they, are, they hate water, uh, these nanoparticles will go there. So we have now a mechanism uh, to target to specific cancers. Uh, we also did, uh, because uh, a lot of the, most of the experiments, you probably know if you, you've been in jet space, are done in petri dishes, so in 2D. So you grow the cells in 2D, you apply the drug or the nanoparticles, you, you get immediate and um, basically the, the cell see the drug immediately, which is never what happens in the body when you inject the, the drug or you swallow the drug. The, 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 the way the drug needs to pass through tissue, need to cross a lot of barriers to get to the target. So we use three-dimensional cell culture and tumor spheroids. So we basically grow, uh, not on a petri dish, but actually in suspension, the cells grow as spheroids. We can get it up to um, um, uh, maybe 500 microns uh, viable, uh, 
uh, tumor spheres, and here we have uh, tumor spheres of liver cancer and breast cancer. So liver cancer has a lot of that CAV1 protein with lipid draft uh, with cholesterol rich areas in the membrane, and you see that that tumor spheres, uh, the nanoparticles, which are kind of purple yellow here, uh, penetrated throughout the sphere. The, the, God, the, the nanoparticles were able to penetrate until the center of the sphere, while the breast cancer, they could not. So we know that we can use those nanoparticles in liver cancer, but not in breast cancer. And this is just to show that they are specifically, um, this is a, a they can target uh, to tumors in vivo, in living mass, this is whole body imaging. The mice has two tumors, uh, uh, one on each side. We injected the particles with the dye, and you see they accumulate selectively in the tumor. So this is colon cancer, which also expresses high amounts of this protein. And we can quantify the levels in the tumor. And we see a little bit also in the lungs, because the lungs the, have a lot of vasculature. Um, you actually cured the mouse. Yes. Yes, so we, we had, yeah, we didn't, yeah, we, we, we did, uh, we didn't want to show all the, the, the data of that, but we actually got very impressive uh, anti-tumor activity uh, using those nanoparticles in liver and colon cancer. And um, here is the, is the colon cancer, we show basically that um, if you follow the black uh, triangle here, these nanoparticles, we inject it once a week. So usually the patient would take it, the pill twice a day to get any response, and we injected once a week, and we got the same response, and we follow up toxicities and side effects. We didn't see any side effect. Uh, we know with humans, it's basically unbearable. And people want to get off the treatment with this drug. And another well, thing, I would just say though that the uh, we don't know whether we, the the particle we think is actually for like your tumor spheroid stuff. Your, the particle there's in that case there's no blood vessels, so. Yeah. In that particular tumor, the, it, it, it didn't stick to, to the one type of cancer that had the one, it, it, had, it stuck to the cancer that had one marker, but not, but, but had the marker, but not the one that didn't have the marker. But we know that this will stick to the blood vessels, so yeah. if, if there's a, if, there, if this marker is present in breast cancer, or any cancer, it could still... In the, yeah, yeah. deliver it through the blood vessels of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although we, we tried to tell, I guess, this model and the liver cancer, they have the target both on cancer cells and mm -hmm. on vasculature, but I guess we, yes, we, we believe that the, the targeting the blood vessels is more important than actually targeting the cancer itself. So what was that data in mice just now? Yes, this so is this mice so measuring the volume of the tumor. Okay. So we reject the treatment and we measure the tumor. Yeah, I just didn't know whether it was mouse or yeah. something yeah. else. Yeah, this is a mouse. We actually we want to start a kind of a clinical trial in dogs. Yeah, uh, dog, in dog patients. patients to see if we can, uh, dogs that uh, uh, failed all treatments and uh, we might offer this treatment. Uh, so veterinary application? Yeah. Well, in this case, it's a veterinary, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clinical trial on dogs with cancer with, where their owners take them, bring them in. But in this case, it would be a stage one trial, so it would just be, or phase one trial, it would just be, uh, at the, at, we could see if it works, but the main um, reason for the trial to see that whether it's Side toxic effects. or not. And so that's the, that's where in, uh, Does that do double duty? Because I know that um, before you go into humans, they require three trials, one non-rodent, and they usually do either dogs or monkeys. So would, would a trial in dogs that was actually a veterinary procedure be counted as that, or would you have to do a separate? The FDA would have to tell us in the end whether they like that data or not. Um, mm -hmm. I, it would definitely be very supporting uh, for that uh, purpose, so that the FDA would allow us to bring it to human trials but I don't know if it would be everything they would need. They probably would need to make sure that we have a dose escalation trial at some point where we ramp up the dose to make sure that there's nothing bad that's gonna happen over any dose that would be given in a person. But, um, but it's yeah, It's really it nice though that, that you're, if, if somehow those animal studies could be changed, the requirement for those could be changed such that rather than having a laboratory animal that you give a cancer to, that you're actually working with animals that have cancer that you want to try and help. I mean, it, well, I mean there's, so luck, much, no. there's so much resistance yeah. to animal yeah. testing. Well, well luckily, in, in cancer, the, there are very few types of cancer studies that are done where cancer, that I've seen, at least at Sloan Kettering, where cancer is given to anything but a mouse. So. When a, can, when, when a study is done in a mouse and it's shown to work in a mouse with, with cancer, that at that point, 
the question is now, how do we get it to humans? So it's just the talk studies that are so done it's just, Exactly. Okay. It would be done in anything bigger than a mouse. Right. And the injections were not on to the cancers themselves. They yeah. were systemic, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. It, all IV, in this case, tail vein, but yeah, yeah. IV, IV injections. And how come the, the substance injected was not eliminated by the body? You said it was the ones that the injections. So that means it's circulating in the body for a, a significant period of time. Yeah. Why? So uh, it, it, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so when the drug, for example, normally given orally, it dissolves into single molecule and it just just diffuse randomly throughout all blood vessels and all cells. Now, when you confine it into a nanoparticles, it's actually in a solid state. So think about it, it's like a um, a very dense amount of drug packaged in a way that it's not soluble. So now the drug is not soluble and it's circulating. It's basically like a vi in the size of a virus. Yeah, back to uh, the most illustrative picture, which is that, right? Yeah, so, so we have, uh, uh, it's circulating. Now, uh, there's two ways that the nanoparticles are targeted or ac accumulated in cancer cells or in tumors. It's first the blood vessels in the tumor are not mature because it's like a new organ in the body. So the, it's, the vessels are not mature, there's some blood leaking out into the tumor, and then the particles can leak out because they're big, they do not diffuse everywhere, they just circulate. So uh, they're not big, they cannot uh, penetrate into blood vessels, it's a, because it's not a small molecule. So now when they accumulate there, the question is, do they have a way to internalize into the cells? And that's the CAV1 uh, mechanism. So I understand that part, but um, what I don't understand is how they get out. If, if they don't target, the, do they just continue circulating? So the question is, like, die? when it gets into a cell, it gets uh, like the images I show here. So when you see that when they are inside cells, they can degrade because they're acidic microenvironment in the inside of the cell, in the lysosomes or in the tumor microenvironment, it's a little bit acidic. And then protein start to it's it's very it's it's like the the garbage can of the cells start to degrade everything in the acidic microenvironment. The drug is released and then it can diffuse. And we can show we have a, a, all the data that shows that the drug is inside the cancer cells. We engage the target, um, like the, the strap inhib inhibit the enzyme, so we know that the enzyme is inhibited. And uh, we have the same IV injection when we dissolve the drug in oil, in cremophore oil, uh, in ethanol, uh, we don't see that effect. So we, we, we do a fair comparison, we inject the drug IV and the nanoparticles IV and see the benefit of the, of the particles. And also the circulation time? Yeah, yeah so we know also that the, the, the levels of the drug in the blood is enhanced. So instead of the drug, usually if you take a pill, after four hours, imagine Tylenol, it gets washed away. We inject the particles, we see it even after 24 hours, you can measure, see that the drug in the blood. Uh, although not in a soluble form, in the nanoparticle form. Um, and the hope is that, you know, that because it's, it's in the blood for a long time in the particle form, it has more chance to hit the target, which is the blood vessels that have this marker, this CAV1. And, and those are the, the those are um, rich CAV1 uh, blood vessels, uh, or rich blood vessels that appear in many cancers. So another thing, because we have a dye, so it's a dye drug complex, we saw that, the, we actually also accidentally saw this during imaging in a microscope, that the dye can be bleached. Basically, the dye is fluorescent, it emits light when you shine light upon it, but if you shine light too much, it gets degraded and become dark. And we know that the mechanism is, is instead of emitting light, it's, uh, it's making free radicals. So these are oxygen radicals. And that actually can be used in photodynamic therapy, when you basically have a molecule that you shine light, it's light sensitive. You break down the molecules with light, it turns into free radicals. The free radicals can actually kill the cancer as well. And we're actually doing a little bit faster. So this is an example of photo bleaching. So you have a dye inside a cell. You shine high amount of light or high power laser into that, into that area. And then the dye just is bleached. It turned into radicals. So you over uh, kind of heat the, the overwork the dye. And this is basically when we thought that uh, we can collaborate that with Mate. Yeah. So, uh, so, so this was an uh, interesting point when I, when, I, when I actually came to the lab and uh, uh, I was just looking around what they do and uh, I, I found out that actually they do this uh, kind of interesting and very experimental, uh, developing this very experimental treatment. Uh, and, you know, it works with light, 
uh, it sews into a tissue. So I was kind of, oops, what happened? Uh, so, so I was kind of thinking that, you know, this reminded me uh, sort of if, if, if I can put film between the light source and for a light source and uh, the tissue, what if uh, this could kind of create some sort of analog photo process, but with living tissues, right? And uh, so we started experimenting with that, uh, and uh, we developed this project, uh, uh, which uh, uh, I call Well Played Utopias. Um, and uh, so, uh, why is it called Well Played Utopias? Because it is experimental cancer uh, treatment. It is not applied yet to the patients, it's not running. So, so it's interesting to see for me, as the laboratory as itself, how it kind of produces something that could possibly be in the future very helpful or, or useful to uh, human body enhancement or like, you know, for, for human health. And, but still, is it, it is in the kind of uh, beginning, uh, in, in, the, in the sort of spot where uh, it, it could it could grow. It's it's not applied yet. So so that's uh, that's kind of interesting to to see these consequences like the whole kind of package. And so when I was looking for what type of uh, image or a picture to project with this uh, after we tested it a couple of times, so I figure out that probably some it will be the best to start to use not, you know, kind of like black and white photographs with a lot of shades of gray, but the best for the testing would be just uh, black or white, like, uh, you know, uh, very contrasty. So, because they wanted to see the edges and how it works, how the whole, whole, whole thing works. Um, and so uh, I came across a uh, long time ago, um, uh, Sir Thomas More, who uh, wrote the book Utopia. And uh, of course, the, since then, 15, 16, we use the words to describe a uh, sort of uh, imaginary place where which could uh, could be kind of ideal place how you know things are supposed to be, um, and uh, it's more an idea than uh, of course reality because like the, it's it's a, it's the aim, but uh, the path to it is uh, you know it's what it is. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy, but uh, definitely it's not. The utopia itself is not a destination, but the path to it is very important, and that's what actually uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of uh, laboratories is aiming for, just to uh, kind of create a sort of disease-less body, <coughs> basically. Um, and so these are iterations of uh, that alphabet. Uh, it was it is based off Greek alphabet. It kind of might remind. Russian alphabet, but it's not because uh, also Russian alphabet is based off Greek alphabet, so they're kind of they have a common inspiration, but they're different. Uh, and so this is uh, this is uh, the, the, the Utopian alphabet was uh, from the book of Thomas More, and he kind of like Tolkien invented even uh, like their own language of the island of Utopia, and these were kind of uh, uh, written in their own uh, characters, and this, this is the alphabet. It was only 22 letters instead of 24. And then, if you observe history of the calligraphy or of the fonts, so it, it was kind of popping up, up within the history time to time. And uh, it was exactly in the times when people were thinking kind of about, uh, you know, more, more about the future. Uh, because there are times when people don't uh, like think less about the future, and then times when people uh, kind of think more about the future. So, so always the time when people told, told about the future produced different iteration of a font, of that same font of Utopia, which uh, this one is an example of Art Nouveau font of the Utopia from, uh, uh, I forgot it's uh, end of 19th or beginning of 20th century. Um, so uh, yeah, and this is my iteration based on that. And this, uh, this font face, this is a custom font which uh, I developed just to, uh, to be the most effective for what we were trying to do, like most simple shapes, just you know, to, to, to test this idea if it is even possible to project those images. Uh, and uh, so we, we started 
doing it kind of uh, uh, we, we, ca uh, we came up to this point where we actually uh, placed the film or kind of uh, like a sticker from the bottom and then we were irradiating we were growing uh, the, the cancer tissues in the well plates uh, that's uh, like a collection or grid of petri dishes basically and uh, uh, so we were growing monolayer of, the, of uh, cancer cells and we actually first we had to find and it was kind of a long long way This, this is a one, more a little bit more than one year of work of a project because it, it took a long time actually to but find what, what what cancer will make the perfect sheet yeah, to write. Mm -hmm. So we tried a lung cancer, ovarian cancer. And, and NIH 3T3 cells are not contact inhibited anymore. I'm yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. I no, but, struggled but, with a wound yeah. experiment for a long with time. With a scratch essay? Yeah. And <laughs> I couldn't get them to form a monolayer. Mm -hmm. But also they grow, yeah, they grow on top of each other, but they also grow kind of uh, fiber, uh, like junctions. And they're not supposed to. They're supposed yeah. to form a contact inhibited monolayer. And well, they've, yeah. they've, they're, they've gone from their original semi-transformed yeah, so state. So just to fast. find the right paper. You know, mm -hmm. it's like we're trying to find the paper to mm -hmm. write on. And you yeah. need the paper to be flat. Yeah. And if the paper is clumpy, you don't make a good drawing. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so what did you finally, how did, what was the secret? So back I know, we, we, oh, yeah. so we're drawing a lot of uh, different types of cancer so yeah. in the lab. So we have almost every type. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, what kind pancreas. of yeah. so pancreas. Uh, pan pancreatic, but also ovarian, <laughs> work, actually. And uh, there was maybe one more which I forgot, but we decided not to use that because uh, the. the uh, uh, that was just. Yeah, I think so. Um, but, but, but uh, yeah, the uh, pancreatic one because uh, of. We, we had to really see like how, how the cancer grows, actually, because like a lot of. Like the, the the normal way how it grows or uh, it's you know for a lot of cancers it's just, they just grow whichever way like they don't know what is top or the bottom more or less but for example pancreatic cancer it kind of just grows with the gravity sort of right yeah <laughs> it's very tight it's very tight junction yeah. I mean it, it leaves no sp empty space is that yeah. all pancreatic cell lines uh, or only probably few? not I mean we, we we have a couple. But uh, it, it's very it's epithelial, it's very epithelial, so it means a lot of adhesion molecule. It's very mm -hmm. sticky, uh, and, and it has to be also sticky attaching and all that. So uh, yeah, and and also I realized like that there that what's the difference between how easy it is to kill like normal cell from a body and how really hard is with the same stuff how uh, it's really hard to kill actually the cancer cell like the, how how <laughs> how how hardy they are actually. So so that was also. Uh, so, so this was the first thing we were researching, uh, we, we were trying to find, and then when we found the uh, like ideal uh, candidate for the continuous sheet of paper uh, or the monolayer, so then we started experimenting with actually different uh, uh, dyes and, and molecules, uh, with different, different nanoparticle-based drugs, and we, uh, we ended up with uh, the IR783 and serafinib, which uh, Yossi was actually describing because uh, that one seemed to be the most effective. And then we were looking for the proper, uh, for the, uh, proper wavelength, and uh, uh, this one is actually a learning, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we were looking for the proper wavelength of uh, you know, to, to excite uh, those particles because uh, so, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but it's a combination of uh, like uh, power of the laser and the wavelength and the timing. So it's, it's not that easy actually to, to do this. And because of we did this so many times for this project uh, on, on, a, on a kind of large scale. So, so we, we actually kind of really had to uh, pin down or ha even had to pin down like what would be the exact wavelength where we are most successful. And then uh, this uh, actually came back to the lab where uh, it, it inspired Aviram, right? Yeah. Uh, a, a doctor um, uh, who works with the lab, you can maybe... Yeah, so, so um, Aviram is a head and neck surgeon, so he treats usually tumors of the oral cavity in the throat. And he was interested in photodynamic therapy and it basically, with the combination of drugs uh, and nanoparticles, and uh, we kind of started after working with Mate about uh, 
uh, using photodynamic therapy to actually treat uh, tumors. And we, if we didn't, I guess before we worked with Michael, we didn't know what's the most effective wavelength, laser power, because he had all, because I was busy with all my, my research. Matthew was doing his own research, and I have to optimize the art, which actually, so we have like uh, an already perfect protocol that Matt uh, developed to use the exact same, like how much time you have to feed the, the cancer, with how yeah. much time you have to irradiate them with light, and we're actually gonna uh, with, with implement the, that. And next uh, cancer, it's very, it's very um, good candidate for uh, photodynamic therapy because First of all, the laser wavelength the, is, is uh, 808 nanometers, and that wavelength of light is just beyond what you can see, but it's very good for penetrating tissue. So it can go a few centimeters, or definitely uh, at least over a centimeter, into tissue and kill, and basically and hit the particles and still make them kill cells in that, in that uh, distance. And then and in the oral cavity, you don't have that much tissue. It's not like a big mass of tissue in the body having to go very deep in this place you can you can usually you only have a small amount of tissues that you need to go through so it's a good candidate and it kind of worked out with uh, with looking at that cancer and these particles and yeah so 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 this is uh, the, the kind of a very simplified protocol we we, we develop um, and um, yeah and this is uh, this is showing actually how, how the bleaching works again um, and uh, in, in uh, near infrared on the left side, so the the, uh, the black spot is the uh, the spot where it actually hit uh, the, the the radiation uh, the light hit the cells, and this was taken afterwards with the infrared spectrum just to image it, and then the bright field and that's the normal light, and there is uh, yeah, so that's staining staining for cell death for cancer cell death. Um, apoptosis is cell suicide. So. Basically, the, that that circle was where he irradiated with the with the light. It it, it caused all this free radical generation of those uh, of, you know free radicals to form at that spot in those cells, and then that's showing on the right after 24 hours those cells are dead. So so, so, oh. so the pictures you created are they very um, they they don't last very long? Uh, they actually don't last very long. So we well. Uh, we had to take action. So, so you irradiate the cells, and you can see where uh, the tissue was impacted be uh, because those uh, normally, when when the when the when the whole full tissue is uh, uh, penetrated by the particles, so you see it as a shiny kind of silvery, uh, like or or, or you, know, uh, you know a piece of uh, tissue, right? But if you if you bleach uh, if you bleach the cells so suddenly if you take a, again a, if you look at it with infrared camera with infrared light so you see actually the the, the dark spot there where uh, uh, that where it was uh, bleached so actually this way you can see that and then of course after 24 hours with the apoptosis so you will see actually the dead cells as a as a gap yeah, but like you a, can still see the, the infrared. Probably after 24, but not more mm -hmm. than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but when he created art about it, he made it permanent. He took a picture of this. Yeah. So, yeah. so I took a picture of that. <laughs> infrared picture, infrared image, actually. Yeah, uh, which I'm gonna show. So, so these are these are the borders between uh, irradiated and non-irradiated. Uh, uh, so you can see that there's more living cells there over there that are kind of dying. Uh, and this is this is uh, another image from there. You can see the edge, the shiny edges. Uh, living cells and the other part, well, in, uh, with the nanoparticles and the other part is the bleaching. So, so the IR would normally cause the particles to fluoresce. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. that's why you're seeing a black spot. Is yeah. If they're photo bleached, they can no longer fluoresce. Exactly. Under uh, the IR. Exactly. Okay. So here you see all of them. All the white is the particles. The black had particles, but we just used too much laser. Mm -hmm. So instead of light, they're turning into radicals. So right. You're that's using three different ways of visualizing them, so I just yes, wanted yeah. to make it clear yeah. to everybody that that's what was going on. Mm -hmm. and, and also, when you're seeing, you, you know, you're not seeing individual particles here, you're seeing a lot of particles accumulated into cancer cells, so there's you know, billions and billions of particles in here. Well, well, what fraction of the cells do you think that were in your irradiated area were killed in the, in the one application? 50%, 2%, 90%? Yeah, I didn't do such a thorough analysis of that, 
but I would say it's, it's probably more than 50. Uh, it seems to be more, because uh, it's not just the diet, there's also the seraphinib, there's also a drug involved. I think that's, you know, uh, the, the drug is not involved in the fluid dynamic, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was, I think it's... Uh, so the, the material that you started with had some drug yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah drug exactly. That was complex. Sorafenib, okay. a drug with uh, IR-783, which is a nanoparticle. Okay. So, and together. The, and the strategy now is that you know, we want to use this, uh, the drug dye conjugate as uh, a treatment anyway, but, uh, and that should cause cancer cell death, but then you uh, irradiate, and when the dye is there, now you're, you're giving it a boost. You're right. Right. turning it to 11. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the white spot is just a scratch. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you can see this is uh, one of the first letters we tried to. Kind of... <laughs> oh, yeah, tracing through the letter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Looking at the borders. Yeah. So is the reason why, because we do bacterial photography upstairs and the edges are never this sharp, is it because you're using a laser? This was actually, uh, it, this is because it has a, 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 a finely printed uh, yeah, the, 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 photo yeah. Yeah. Photo and, and, yeah, so 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 it's very like, uh, it, it has sharp edges. We have a mask too, but uh -huh. it doesn't usually uh, get this. I think it might be because of the laser, and the laser is very close actually to ah. uh, to to the to the dish. So you don't need to focus it through a lens or anything. No, like that. exactly. Yeah. We don't focus it at all. Well, actually, we do. Because you focus it through the microscope. Uh, it, uh, this is the uh, microscope. Uh, yeah, if you look from the bottom, oh, so so inverted yeah, microscope. We use the right? same the same laser that we use to shine, just the full power, and we just map it yeah. with the joystick, all right, mm -hmm. left, right, left to scan the whole well. But oh. but, yeah. but I, I think that when you focus actually the the microscope, yeah, so focus. so you kind of yeah. focus also focus. the light. The light, yes, definitely. You very you very much focus the light through the microscope. Yeah. And is the mask on the bottom of the plate? Yes. Okay. So it goes all from the bottom. It's kind of right. reworded, actually, okay. because of the nature how the microscope. And uh, oh, these yeah. are the letters. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> and there's a full alphabet. <laughs> uh, more. All, all twenty-two. We did all twenty-two how letters. How come there are twenty-six letters in the alphabet? I'm Be because that's coming out of uh, Greek alphabet. Oh. And the Greek alphabet has only twenty-two letters okay. yeah. for some reason. Uh, and this is how it is exhibited, actually. Uh -huh. uh, and and it's, it's exhibited, it's actually a graph. It's, it's really weird, but so we did, you know, we were, we were working on this really one year and it was like, so, uh, like usually it worked, but sometimes it didn't and it was kind of like really long process, a lot of work. And so uh, this way, oh, ah, I got this. How do I shine the, the, the Oh, okay. <laughs> You're an expert now at lasers. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. so, so, the, so the first line, that's the kind of the best letters we could get. And then if you go down, so these are the different iterations we had to do for each letter to get the best letter. So, so in science, was, we, we have error. But in art, we, we'll show you the error. We have a process. <laughs> no, we have yeah. a lot of failures. Yeah, exactly. exactly. yeah, they're not here. We're going to have to worry about positive and unpublishing negative results. <laughs> <laughs> the negative results are positive in this case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's all, also like, you know, the path to kind of uh, utopia or better tomorrow because uh, it's, it's not just like one straight line it's not that easy so so you have failures but you learn from the failures and all of this stuff so anything improvement of anything you learn from the failures so yeah but what mm -hmm. we're seeing here are cells that are luminous and cells that are not luminous we're not seeing yes. light in that cells yeah. you are seeing the cells which will be living and those which will die in 24 hours you, you, you yeah. don't see those. The, black, the, the black blacker what you're visualizing is the luminescence. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. we, could, we could have done, uh, I guess, but the, the, the quantum yield of the death, the apostolic is staining, is the negative picture of that is basically imaging the death versus life. Mm -hmm. is not, you, you can't get good pictures because the, 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 the light the, of the staining is not that good, it's, it's, it's a blue. It's blue dye. It's a blue dye, right? It's a, it's, it's a blue dye. Yes, it's mm -hmm. a blue dye. Well, it's but it's a UV. Right. It's mm -hmm. like it's like that. Yeah, so it's, it, yeah. it's very hard to take a good image. Yeah. Uh, and, and and also, but I mean, you could. But uh, yeah, we 
this was I, I decided for this because it was just also it was easier to take it, but also it was uh, kind of more like rich because because these are just about to die. They're not dead yet, but this is on the edge of life. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. And we're coming to the other uh, project we are working on right now. And by the way, those each of those plates are what are they made on? They're aluminum. Uh, each one of those letters. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so these letters are now printed on uh, aluminum discs, like seven and a half inches approximately each disc, uh, and it's a it's a dice up process, uh, which is uh, like a process of transfer of uh, digital uh, photo using like uh, several different layers, like besides besides the 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 the, uh, the aluminum sheet. So, and so how much area is this taking up? Uh, so like, this is, I believe, uh, five. Uh, oh God, it's like six, six meters or seven meters. I don't know now the oh, wow. <laughs> It's it's pretty big. It's like uh, bigger, like like kind of like from that wall, that column until we have beyond that column. Uh, and it's exhibited right now. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. I forgot to put in the image, but I have it. I can show you. <laughs> it's exhibited with the Ars Electronica Arts and Science um, exhibition in uh, Slovakia right now until like mid January. So, yeah. Um, and now we're coming to Nano Construct. That's a piece of work. Yeah, that, that's a. Just like four more slides. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, it's, it's, it's so, it's, yeah. so, so we're, we're working on, and uh, this is uh, um, based on uh, computational chemistry and uh, like. Uh, while they're developing these drugs, which we saw the effects of just now, uh, so so this is this is how, uh, kind of how to improve uh, the development of these drugs uh, using uh, uh, machine learning and like some AI algorithms uh, and uh, um, computational chemistry basically. And uh, it is interesting that we are right now developing a. Uh, like a, kind of like a leg, Lego or a construction set, 3D printed uh, construction set uh, that uh, could probably help uh, scientists to uh, understand actually sometimes really uh, not uh, like, you know, not, um, I don't want to say not understandable, but like the results of uh, what, what AI is predicting or the machine learning is predicting. So sometimes, you know, you can know all of the elements you put in, or all of the data, but you don't sometimes know why why it connected uh, the exact uh, algorithms together because there are thousands or hundreds of algorithms working together. So, so this construction set might just uh, speed up the process of like uh, you know f f figuring that out. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a video. Okay, so here I see that. <laughs> just show and we did a simulation. This is the dye. This is what makes the nanoparticles with the drug water soluble. So you have the red thing here. That's the sulfate. Uh, it's sulfur with three, uh, with three oxygens, and this is negatively charged. So this is the drug, and when you mix them in water, they spontaneously self-assemble in a way that the drug will form a kind of a nano crystal core, and the dye would wrap around it and stabilize. This is how the dye kind of I'll just show you how the crystal core is formed and the dye is kind of protecting it from leaking out in the water. Mm -hmm. So we actually 3D printed that, but I forgot to bring it. <laughs> and, uh, but but I'll, I'll show you some um, um, yeah. images. But, but also it's important to say that this is simplified because normally these molecules are kind of shaking yeah. all the time because is, there is another molecule uh, interacting with them. Is this thing that you just showed about, is that unusual? Is this not seen in any other, is well, this unexpected for you? What you for, for me, it was definitely unexpected. Uh, I didn't know about, uh, I mean, the process of nano, it's nano precipitation is known that you can have a, a nanoparticles made of a precipitate, but usually instead of a dye, you will have a big polymer. You have a big, big molecule that will wrap around this, but here we have many, many small molecules in self-assembling spontaneously together. It's more like a virus self-assembly, yeah. like a yeah. viral capsule. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, so for us that was uh, new. We haven't published this yet. We're still uh, in review. And, we're, and, and the novelty is how to know which drugs will form that or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's the machine learning part, actually. Yeah, so this is kind of a 
there's three layers of stuff here going on. So we, we did the whole work on figuring out that uh, these particles form, uh, but now there's two other comp uh, things that, that kind of also seem to interact with the art. One was that this, uh, let me go back one more, back, back to that for just a second. So that, so that you, movie you saw is, uh, is, just a, uh, is just a bunch of pictures, but, the, but we're doing uh, computational molecular dynamics work to actually simulate the formation of these particles, how they would really form by simulating it on the femtosecond time scale. And yeah, that's what that comes out with that. So that this is a so we can do the so we're working with a, mo, a computer scientist, a, a computational chemist, to figure out why these things are forming um, and, and how they're forming, and to understand what kind of parameters we have. Can we use any drug, etc.? Um, and we're trying to understand that on you know kind of the why. But also we've been able to do another set of computation called machine learning where we can take the, just using the properties of these molecules, the drug molecules and the dye, we've been able to um, come up with a learning algorithm to figure out which drugs we could actually put into the particles using this method. And now we have a list of hundreds of molecules that we know will, uh, with almost 100% certainty or very high for, for this kind of mechanism, uh, algorithm, uh, which drugs we can put in. And so now, we're able at uh, Sloan Kettering to go to any of these doctors who are interested in these personalized medicines and say, we can now completely re-change the properties of your drug by putting them into a nanoparticle. Most nanoparticle work is very trial and error, which, which, makes, um, which, which you know, crashes out in the solution into a precipitate, which forms into a particle. Now it's been um, really improved with the computation. And so this machine learning plus this um, uh, molecular dynamics is really giving us a lot of tools to understand it, but the molecular dynamics pictures now kind of gave us this art science uh, um, handle as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, as, as again, like it will take really like it is not impossible, but it will take really long time to parse through the decisions what the program made and why, and and so so this uh, this might help. Uh, maybe uh, in some ways, uh, when when you can uh, be, uh, as an inspiration, but also uh, yeah, when you can. Yeah, go ahead. We thought is that another thing is to do a simulation in. So we have in this experiment in vitro, we have in vivo, which is animals, and in silico is experiment in the computer, and we started doing the experiment in plastico, with <laughs> 3D printing all the drug molecules, putting magnets and in the different products, and then shake it in a box, and then see how they actually self-assemble. Have you seen those little viral self-assembly yeah. toys? Yeah, we saw yeah. So uh, that's how we're so inspired. Same, yeah, so doing the same so thing. Cool. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so, yeah, this is now it's to the virus of the it's, it's drug nanoparticles. So, the, that's that's really the, really the how to put in the magnets and where to put them. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, so now it's a more of design problem which we're <laughs> working on, but uh, yeah. And we make a kinesthetic or kinetics uh, sculpture yeah. of a real nanoparticle that self assembles by itself, but you can see all the molecules because they're, okay. big, they're big. How big do you think you want to make this? Uh, well, it's a. Uh, it, so it's ideal is to have some uh, the, the nanoparticles big like this, but if but then you have to keep in mind that when one one actual particle forms, so it, it contains hundreds of those par particles. Uh, so, so so if you have a uh, so the molecule will be big, one molecule or, or like that. I don't, but then you have to go really slow. So. You don't want gravity. Because yeah, exactly. it's going to have weight, whereas right, yeah. in s these little things in solution are not going to be that effective. Yeah, this is where we are break. trying to figure yeah. out the ratios <laughs> and all of that because it's not, not that simple because it cannot go too, sl too small with the 3D printing and with the magnets. But also you cannot go too big. So what is the <laughs> ideal kind of amount? Mm -hmm. Because you, you, it, everything is multiplied by, let's say, 100. So, yeah. yeah. So, so I don't, this is not my field in any way. So this might be a stupid question. but um. They're not when, when, questions, just naive ones. It might be a naive question. <laughs> uh, like this picture, for example. Mm -hmm. um, no, maybe it's a bad picture. Uh, if in, in your video animation where it forms mm -hmm. the, in your video animation yeah. where it forms the particle, um, the individual molecules don't bind. bind. So when you talk about molecule, do you mean to the, the individual molecules, uh, all of them uh, bind each other uh, kind so, of in a low kind of for, uh, low binding, but totally. So when, when you're talking about the particle, yeah. the you said 
used the word nanoparticle. Yes. And, and when you were talking about molecule, you were referring to the entire particle as one molecule. No, 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 no. no. It's another molecule. Yes. <coughs> yeah. I saw, sometimes so uh, I I might uh, miss uh, <laughs> misrepresent it, right? But uh, oh, because, yeah. because because yeah. it's actually it's assembly, assembly, assembly of, of molecule. Yeah. Of yeah. molecule. It's not it's not becoming a big molecule. Yes. It's just many mm -hmm. small molecules. So mm -hmm. the reason so, the small uh, molecule, molecule is that you like all the small particles are molecules. Like, oh, don't call a particle molecule. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, so, but what he means is every single individual uh, thing that you can separate out uh, mm -hmm. without any chemical bonds between them is a yeah. is a molecule. Yeah. The, when these things come together, the forces that are bringing them together, and we call the, this process of self assembly, mm -hmm. um, all these forces are very uh, much weaker than chemical bonds. And so we're talking about the forces that bring together like. Uh, soap and water mm -hmm. and and grease, mm -hmm. so that forms into a you know, or you know really all the forces that are holding together so, a virus particle or a, a cell. Um, so all of these are very minor uh, but, forces. The driving force, I think, for the drug to come together is first the it hates water. It's not soluble so, in water, so it wants to come to other drug mm -hmm. molecules, and then the dye just come and coat it and makes mm -hmm. it stable. Because it, without the dye, they will just come together and precipitate as a big chunk of white. Yeah. Sand, and it, it just prevents it. Yeah. So I got a machine learning question, if it's okay. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, so typically machine learning, like a big problem is like how do you determine how well your solution was? Uh, like, so how did you guys kind of decide that this was an adequate solution? So, uh, our question basically was, can we predict which drug self-assembly this way? And we had the training set of drugs that, I mean, I tested eventually 60 dr different drugs, and I had half the drugs self-assembled, half the drug, I mean, I, I divided it half and half, input into the software, and I basically got correlations of different descriptors. Descriptors are, way, uh, molecular descriptors are ways to describe a molecule with numbers. It's basically a matrix of numbers, so we gave us, uh, if you want to differentiate the drugs that self-assemble and not self-assemble, a molecular descriptor that's called the burden matrix. Uh, if the value is above seven, it will self-assemble. If it's below seven, it will not self-assemble. And th that thing, basically, then we, what is this burden matrix? What is the seven? Then we find out it's, it's related to fluorine atoms in the drug, well, double but, bonds. But stepping back, we, the, um, the tools we use for, for machine learning here are normally used by the drug uh, discovery, uh, uh, medicinal chemistry industry. Um, and this is uh, called uh, QSAR, Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship, is, the, is what they're doing. And they basically all they do is they take a, uh, a they, you know, here you draw, can draw molecules, like, you know, you draw the, stru the structure of a molecule. They can turn that the information from these molecules into numbers, um, like molecular weight, which, which atoms are in the, in the structure, just using the structure of the molecule that you can the draw. Geometry yeah, from the graph geometry, from graph theory, take the, the geometry of the yeah. molecule yeah. using graph theory and mm -hmm. having like a coordinate. It's, you can describe a molecule with many, many different numbers and they basically throw all that stuff. Uh, in a supercomputer. Yeah, well, or it's, in this case you don't need a supercomputer. Yeah, no. And then they kind of figure out how, how do these different molecular properties uh, correlate with things like how well a drug works or binds to something. And in this case, you know, we took all these tools that are normally used by medicinal chemists, uh, just on, for us looking at these small drug molecules, and we applied them to formation of nanoparticles. And to validate the model, we made predictions of unknown molecules. We took random molecules from a, a, a vendor, yeah. and we said, okay, put it into the software, this will form, this would not form, this would change. We had like 96 uh, accurate percent. So we did so, all the so normal. So you can test it afterwards yeah. because yeah. it's accessible. How many features were there in the model, the, the training set? Like you, you said the Yeah, how many molecules we had in the, in the training set? The first training set was like 18 molecules, which is not a lot for, for a training right. set, but yeah. there were, the, the thing is we chose the molecules that are very similar. So at the beginning, when you look at it as a chemist, you know, this molecule would, is not appropriate because it is water soluble. So if it's a water-soluble molecule, it would not precipitate. <laughs> and so I, I, I took all the molecules that I would n never guess would, you know, I never predict. As a chemist, I look at the structure and say, this should self-assemble, and then it doesn't. So I put it in the training set. So all the things that are obvious as a chemist, I took out. So all the things that I, I couldn't understand, I put it into the training set. And then I, so it's very, very similar molecule with diff small differences. Mm -hmm. And the computer kind of found the small differences. 
And the reason he didn't do it, couldn't do it, you know, so he could predict now hundreds of molecules that are, that are very likely to, to make a nanoparticle, uh, many, many, many drugs, but the number is that he'd been able to actually validate that they all form nanoparticles to do the experiments it, it were much smaller because doing those experiments take quite a bit of time and, yeah. and validation. And that was my question. Last time I was here at Genspace, I was a class in uh, creating creams and lotions. And this very is very relevant similar to, this. to emulsification. <laughs> so how does this compare to emulsification in that sense? Yeah, and this is, uh, the forces involved are exactly the same. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, an emuls uh, uh, you know, drug formulation is uh, traditionally uh, the same exact thing. People would take um, uh, the, the stuff that people use now in drug industry um, that's not nano, but is used to take a very hydrophobic molecule that would never you know, dissolve in water and put it into the body. Um, if you know about, uh, we were just talking about this today, uh, this, the, the propofol, the stuff that's, that Michael Jackson uh, was given that eventually caused you know, big problems. Um, that, and he called it his milk because it's white. Yeah. And the reason is that they used uh, uh, cremophore uh, to dissolve it because it's not soluble. And cremophore is a, um, uh, a mixture of castor oil and ethylene glycol. And they rack them together and make this thing that is basically like, a, like soap. It, it, has a, it, it surrounds the drug and it, with hydrophobic part of the molecule. And then it has the ethylene glycol, which is the hydrophilic part. So it basically makes little micelles, little you know, little compa uh, compartments to put the propofol, and those are basically like little tiny nanoparticles almost, and, uh, and, and they, it, they also, scatter light, and that's why they're white. Yeah. Uh -huh. I guess another difference is that uh, we it, this is a spontaneous process of self assembly. You don't need to mix it even. Okay. You know, with emulsifiers, so you, just, uh, you have to mix it really hard, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Here, it's, it's, it happens spontaneously. They'll just yeah. add it. And add the other thing, and add the drug, add the dye, and they will form yeah, spontaneous, yeah. spontaneously. So when you say not, so this is happening at a much smaller, yeah, uh, level. Yeah, per se, yeah. like yeah. collusion or so. It's happening at say, yeah. nano. It's well, it's I mean, also the, this is a, a, yeah. a more a solid state. Emulsifier is more of a, a mixture of like oil and water. Right. There's no solid. Right. Oh, I mean, okay. it is not a lot of solid. Right. Here, the drug is actually in a solid it's kind of state. But, but there's a lot of more space in terms of, of liquid around yeah. each part. Each particle yeah. is surrounded by, you know, we dissolve it in, in liquid. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, so in, in the case of a, a lotion, it's mostly what? It's mostly oil, I, yeah. you know. And in this case, uh, it's basically water and solid, you know, drug, and then a little tiny bit of the thing that, of basically the thing that acts like a soap, surfactant, that will will surround the, the the crystal of drug and make it water soluble. A very very thin layer basically around the outside of it. So, uh, the Mate's uh, work, mm -hmm. this application of the laser, was this accidental that you received information that was going to be helpful to you after he did this process? Is this is this? I mean, is oh, it just like this yeah? I think I think insight from art to yeah. back to science. Yeah, I mean, we we didn't. I mean, when when uh, I thought it was cool to work with Mate, I didn't think that uh, it will help uh, the research a lot. But I guess uh, it was something that um, that if if I would actually focus on doing that thing, maybe I would have discovered that. But I wasn't, and he was working on it. And he, if he discovered the, the optimal conditions for that, and then that makes us think, oh, that, that actually could be useful for therapy. And then, like uh, for you me, know, that was kind of like a byproduct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but, yeah. but, but, but it's think, actually very. Yeah, nice and I think it's, a, <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, we, he's learning from us, we're learning from him, and uh, mm -hmm. we're, I don't know, I feel like we're. Yeah, it's useful. It's, it's, uh, it's fun. Yeah, it's, it's also uh, it's it's a good you know to not because we're always doing these experiments with one you know mindset and when you're doing the, when working with Matt, it was changing a little bit the the way we do the experiments like more fun more uh, it's kind of a. Uh, it's uh, nice to change perspectives. Out of the box. Also, yeah. yeah. also yeah. there's uh, like this huge aspect of like communication to communicate the discoveries from the lab or, or the research was happening uh, to, to the public and right. uh, yeah it's just you know because like 
in, in a way, uh, uh, labs uh, just is, is the way it works. It, they are not that much accessible, uh, if, even though they they're kind of are, but, but you know, not everyone kind of goes there because there are like a security procedures yeah. and all these things. I mean, it's just so not, sometimes not accessible. insights from other worlds. Ex exactly. Like, and, yeah. but, but also the knowledge is so complicated that yeah. it's, it's really kind of... Uh, uh, for me, it's very interesting to be the translator and uh, also both ways maybe. <laughs> and, and sometimes it can kind of create a sort of something interesting. Yeah, as, and I think I learned, I mean, I, 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 I know you learn a lot of skills, but yeah. also we, we, we learn a lot from you in terms of mm -hmm. like, uh, for example, the 3D printing in the movie. So I had this, uh, so before you came, like, we did have the 3D printer and uh, it basically facilitated the whole thing, how, how to do animation, how to, use 3D printers and how to incorporate them in like normal lab stuff like printing lab equipment and stuff like that. So yeah, 3D modeling and yeah. 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 We realize cool. that, uh, you know, when you're doing a bunch of science and you can't communicate it to the public, it's very, uh, you know, it becomes, it, it, it's, or it, it, if it's hard, if it's stuff that has concepts that are hard to communicate to the public, there's, you know, definitely ways to get the word out there. You know, not everybody is going to want to sit, be able to sit through a, uh, a, a talk and or, or want to or, or you know be able to understand it um, but I felt that um, if we could bring it you know someone like Mate and who can really translate the science into something that could, people could appreciate um, even if it's uh, you know e even if it's not going to tell the full story uh, it would be able it would be really helpful and, and bring the science out there in, in you know very different ways what I find really interesting is that I mean, most science in the United States is done with public money. So you're publicly funded. So our tax dollars are funding this work. And yet, for most of the, you know, the time that the NIH has been funding things, um, there hasn't been a really effective communication with the people who are actually funding research, which is the general public. There's been a lot the of papers research. Are not accessible. There's been a lot of, you know, like when you submit a grant, you're supposed to have this outreach component to it, When if it's an NSF grant. Um, they, I remember when I submitted an R01, they said, well, we also want you to, to put your research into a sentence that can be understood by the general right. public. The problem right. was on some <laughs> websites. Yeah. Yeah. Really <laughs> but it's, it's really all lip service. And this <clears throat> trend, I think, to incorporate artists and designers into the lab, and I, I think part of it is because science funding is getting harder to get. And I think our industry as scientists, because I'm a scientist too, if you don't know me, um, We've come to the realization that, you know, this isn't a carte blanche the way it was back in like the 1960s when people just threw money at scientists and expected great things to happen, that there's more responsibility. <coughs> and people are starting to pay attention to what you do. And if you can't adequately um, describe what you're doing in a way that's understandable, uh, you, you kind of, in a way, don't deserve public funding. At least that's the way I would put it, is you have to make some attempt to the customer of your work. You can't just expect them to trust what you're doing and say, well, we're going to cure cancer and just throw money at us. Mm. Yeah. I think those days are gone. Mm. I yeah. Mean, I don't know oh, no, it's, well, well, yeah. well the, main, the main issue, one of the main issues is that you know, the, the total amount of research funding or the percentage China. of the GDP that's used for research is much lower than it used to be. And, and welcome um, to a Republican Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, it's it's actually been very difficult for a anyone to, uh, to 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 make it it's a, a significantly higher. And there was actually just a uh, increase passed uh, recently, but it was a very small increase uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, Do you and, remember the ECS, the Free the Science mm -hmm. Initiative? All right. Well, well, that's another thing. So, so right now, one one issue of this is that is uh, is papers uh, uh, research that's federally funded, there's a big push to make it accessible to everyone, and that is definitely important. And, um, but even the stuff that is federally funded that is locked up by big publishing companies, it's really actually, most of that is locked up for only a certain amount of time, like six or 12 months. But it took a but long fight. Yeah, it's a big fight, that. exactly. And, and even though you were supposed to, when you submitted a grant, prove that in your previous grants you had made stuff public, mm -hmm. people were very slow yeah. a lot of times, because it was yeah. kind of a pain in the neck to yeah. go that extra step.
But I think there's definitely a big uh, push in general to get uh, the word out of you know about about the research. Some of it is more is more accessible. I'm lucky that I'm in a uh, that we're in a field that's you know nanotechnology is is hot stuff, but also most of what we're making is a tangible thing. It's just really small, so we can yeah. see with a microscope. Yeah, yeah. So it's easier to communicate because you can show a picture. Um, and so we're lucky at that. Um, you can I'm, enlarge and, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I and I but I feel that you know even with that, just understanding why we're doing this and why we belong at a cancer center doing this stuff. Um, you know, we need all the help we can get with someone who can communicate this in really, really any way, um, because uh, there's a lot of a lot of noise out there and about uh, you know what the science is doing and where they're going. And of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, of negativity when something fails in, in a, either a drug or this, you know there's, there's there's always bad actors in science. So you're you know, but if if something that you know one does gets out there in a in a in a positive way, and you can see how uh, you know you can break through and it, it, at least understand a little bit more about, you know, people can understand a little bit more about what's going on. It's it's really great. I'll just add to this very quickly. So that's why actually that was one of the major decision points for why to choose the alphabet mm. because it's communication and uh, like you know mm. so yeah. well, <laughs> symbolically. Well, I, mean, of course. I might disagree just a little bit with your observation of making little things because if this actually becomes the cure for cancer, mm -hmm. it's not a little thing. Right. right. <laughs> oh. uh, but then let me go back to the, the, the I think the key to the technology for the cure though is that you're not going to be suffering from off-axis targeting of your poison, the yep. thing that kills the cancer. Yep. Have you identified any risks in that? In other words, are you finding a lot of that off-target uh, so, screen of the, of, the, of, the, of the drug? So, so far, um, and you know, we're trying as hard as we can to get this to the stages where we can understand is met all this, the toxicity of these things to, to figure out how dangerous is this compared to um, uh, with, what's already out there. And now if you've heard about the immunotherapy work where you know, there's, there's side effects that people have no idea why they're happening. Here I think it's a little more predictable um, because we really, you know, these particles are made out of two things. The drug that in many, most cases have already been approved and a, something that's, that, that is holding it. But um, there are definitely, uh, oh, there's always going to be unintended side effects. And the question is, how do we find out what they are and how fast we can figure out what they are? And if there's some, something that's going to happen on a small population of patients, um, you know, this, you know, if this can cure cancer in, or at least you know, postpone cancer many, you know, uh, death many months, um, but then there's some bad side effect in some small population of people, uh, we want to know that as fast as possible, and that's the kind of work we have to do to, to figure that out. At, at least in mice, we, we, know where to, we know how to look. If the, if the drug is known to cause rash in the skin, so we can, we can check the skin. If we know the drug is uh, cardiotoxic, uh, we can uh, specifically look at the heart, see how much. Uh, of course, and the control is to use the free drug, the non-formulated, no, no particle, and see how we do better. And, uh, and then to just, uh, but of course we have to look at everything and yeah. some things unfortunately a mice mouse can't predict like the, yeah. the with the skin rash mice don't actually get skin rash we had to use kind of a proxy marker in the skin to see, show that well if this went to a human it's probably the the human would probably not get skin rash and so we had to find uh so we have to find creative ways to see what these toxicities might be, and some of them can be predicted by a mouse, and many of them not. And that's so, why we have to do a phase one trial at some point. So what happens if you see, like for example, if, if you see that it has bad side effects in mouse, mm -hmm. so it doesn't go further on the ladder towards the humans or something like that, it's, it's stopped, right? Or, or and then, yeah, it's it just like, it's, it, it, this way it's I mean, stopped, because if you see that the, yeah, the mouse it, doesn't, like, you know, like they, they, they usually think if the mouse them. cannot tolerate it, the person yeah. cannot. But actually, that's not true. There's some drugs that the, the mice the, cannot tolerate, but human can tolerate. Uh -huh. There's some drug that the human can tolerate, but dogs cannot tolerate, and uh, vice versa. And uh, it's very mm -hmm. so. It's, it's a the animal models are not uh, definitely not. They're, they're not definitive. They're definitely better than than just using cells because you can always kill cancer in cells. But um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, but unfortunately, so unfortunately, you still have to use the animal, but. At, in, in for cancer research, you know, you go to the mouse and um, and you can get some quite great, you know, but, uh, uh, information from them. But at some point, it, it can't match the, the you know, 
any a larger animal or a human. And uh, but usually we really just do very little between mice and, and humans. Okay. Thank you.